Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Property uh, Mythbusters. I'm John Gilbovich from Real Property Manager. And I'm Ken from Avora Finance. And I'm Deborah from the Property Frontline. You're with Property Mythbusters. We're here to bust myths and misconceptions about the property space. And for the next 10 or so minutes, we'll be discussing the myth that new property is better than existing property. Now, this is a real pivot point for me. I see so much bad activity from the industry on this part. So I'm going to get started first. In relation to clarifying what I mean by new, uh, new property, we're talking about anything off the plan. In particular, for me, <laughs> what I see a lot is people being heavily sold into these types of things. So it's house and land packages out in the middle of nowhere on tiny blocks of land, usually built poorly with really poor quality materials. But, and so when I talk about existing property, I'm talking about this kind of thing. Established property in our suburbs right around Australia, in cities and in regional areas. What I'm going to do is talk about the top, can I, can I swear? I guess I can. The top mm, murky claims that are made about new property that trap buyers. What's actually happening in the market at the moment, and it actually happens whether we're in hot or cool markets, but it gets worse in hot markets. Buyers are keen to get into the market and they, you know, they try and they miss out on some you know, property that they're interested in and then they start to be, I would say, attacked by people who would say they are, they would say they're trying to help the buyers, but really all they're doing is selling them into a bad deal. So one of the first claims you'll hear is the purchase price. They'll say, oh, you can buy this amazing property and it's only, you know, 500000 or 700000 And to your average buyer, that might sound like a really good price. But what you need to do is make sure that you compare where the location of the property is, you compare what else you can get for that money because I guarantee you will be paying a premium for brand new property. And the reason why is because there's so many, the price of the property is loaded up with the costs of all the other people who are going to be making more money than you will. So the marketers get, like I've heard of marketers getting $100,000 per property that they sell. And that's not value in the property. It's actually just that the market is frothy and the developer or the builder has to increase the price to pay for all these other people who are going to be getting handouts from the property. I'm not sure if I can play, I explain that. The point, my point is, if you're heavily sold into a brand new property, someone says this is a really good deal, go on to the portals and just put in the suburb, I'll, just, I'll give you an example in a second, put in the suburb and see what else you can get for this particular Yeah. So using the grants and exemptions will mean you're saving money. If you are going to be able to buy a brand new property for say 750000 and it's because you're getting say $10,000 from the first home buyer's grant and saving, say, 40000 maybe on the stamp duty, if you can buy a better property, like in the next suburb, suburb next door, for 600000 why would you pay seven fifty? because you think you're getting, like, these handouts when you're getting a better value property for 600000 that you can do more with? If you buy one of these brand-new properties... 
even if it's off the plan in one of those mass produced unit blocks or it's house and land where you're buying on this postage stamp, you'll never be able to do anything with it. If you buy something that's existing, it will have, uh, or well, it will typically be usually on a house on a bigger block where there's lots of potential for it in the future. Anyway, try and stop the lecture. Yeah, so this is one of the really big marketing points that the spruikers use when they're trying to trick you into buying something that's bad. They'll say that you can use depreciation to put money in your pocket. But the truth is that if you, if you lose your job or your circumstances change, I would expect you wouldn't be able to afford to keep the property because you wouldn't... Is this a difference between positive and, and, and negative gearing, uh, Deborah? Is that kind of like where you're kind of... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to go into the positive and negative gearing. I want to actually... Because I think that confuses people. But, yeah. Sure. So, so the third point you can, um, that a lot of the uh, heavy marketers will use to trick you into buying will be claim that you can use depreciation to put money in your pocket. First of all, the depreciation will only work if you've got a good income to offset the, the depreciation against. If you aren't earning an income, it means that the property will be cash flow negative and it can't sustain itself that might mean that you might have to sell if you sell you'll have to pay that depreciation back that's something they don't tell you and you won't be selling in the same market it means that while the house next door if it's still brand new it might be still worth or might be still selling for 750 but your house is no longer new you're now in a completely different market and your house might only now we're 500,000. Oh, it drives me insane because I see this happen so often. Right, the next thing that you'll be told is that you'll get oh, this amazing capital gain. And if you're lucky, the flogger will be conservative and say, oh, you'll get a 5% capital gain. But I'll guarantee it so that if you are forced to sell, we'll buy it back at XX price. But you'll find in those promises that in your contract there's so many caveats that it's impossible for them to ever be forced to buy back your property. It, it's a real trap. Here I want to show you exactly why those properties won't ever achieve what um, the floggers are saying. At the moment there's some big companies who are Logging property in this place called Ainsbury. Have either of you come across the, oh. Deborah, you mean the suburb of Ainsbury? Yeah. I, I've, I've never heard of it or stepped foot on it. No. Okay. This is the suburb in Victoria, and this is it here. So they're selling all these brand new house and land packages. So <laughs> how, far, how far is it from the oh, Melbourne CBD? Only 40 minutes from Melbourne CBD at the moment. It's, it's got so much green space around it that there's no way property in this area is ever going to see capital gain probably in our lifetime. And this is the way a lot of the developers make their money. They price these packages to make it sort of similar to area that's closer in where there is demand and where there will be capital growth. You anyway, know, capital growth is a real um, result of the demand supply equation. If you're being marketed into a property in a field, just wait, like come in closer and you can probably buy two <laughs> closer in that are, that are better. Anyway, now John's about to probably... Uh, arm wrestle me with this one. One of the other key points that you'll be told about these new, um, op new property opportunities is that it will attract a better tenant who will pay more rent. Well, not if there's no jobs, not if there's no tenants around. And the other point about this is that the rental guarantees. So because 
a lot of buyers will say, oh, how will I get a tenant? The floggers will say, oh, well, we'll give you a rental guarantee to ensure you won't be out of pocket. Once again, read the contract because there'll be lots of caveats in there. And one big one will be that to ensure that your rental guarantee stays in place, you have to use the company that is selling you the property or you have to use the developer's property management group. And the property management group will charge you a lot more than an independent property manager. And what I tell people is if you hear someone say to you that they'll give you a rental guarantee, turn around and walk in the other direction because good property doesn't require a rental guarantee. You'll have evidence of good vacancies and good demand in that suburb. So if there's, you know, no data, go away. And my final point, new properties, this is what the floggers will say, new properties require less maintenance. So not true. If you haven't been able to walk through a property and see how big it is, there's a high chance that it won't even meet the specs that you've been promised. So it won't meet the size requirements these properties in the in these new areas are just whacked up with such speed that the quality isn't there you will have usually a state-based mandated builder's guarantee but you know you'll still have to follow people up and make sure that the maintenance is done but what's more alarming is I've been to display homes where even the taps and the mirrors are starting to deteriorate in the display homes. How long is, are all of your shiny doorknobs and appliances going to last if they don't even last in the display homes? Yes. I have a lot more to say on this topic. If you would like more information, you can visit my website or email me and I will give you a little bit of a summary. I guess I'll talk a little bit about buying new property uh, versus old property from a finance perspective. So myth being new property is better than old property uh, from a financing point of view, pretty agnostic in terms of which way you go in terms of your purchase. My job is to basically find you the money and make sure that uh, everything stacks up and uh, the application submitted to a lender who will likely approve the loan. That's the main goal. And then from there, costs as well, making sure that you're not uh, paying more than necessary. One thing that I'll probably mention firstly with off the plan purchases, especially for like units in metropolitan areas, uh, just be mindful of two key things. One would be some lenders have a high density postcode restriction. So you just need to double check to make sure that the lender you've got your pre-approval or going to get your pre-approval with does allow you to borrow the amount that you actually need. And this can be done, you know, when we kind of do the numbers and everything like that. The other item is the so, the risk. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So can you clarify what do you mean by high density restriction? It just means that they might not lend more than 70% or 80% of the value of the property. So, In an area that has a lot of apartments. In yeah, in an area that has a lot of apartments and, and the particular property that you're buying is also deemed uh, high density. So yeah. different okay. different lenders have different you know criteria around that. Sometimes it's postcode specific. As soon as you buy a unit within that postcode, it's considered high density. For others, it could be, it's, it has to be classified as a high density postcode and you need more than 10 units in that block. So small units or small builds might you know, go under the radar or not really go on the radar, but, you know, not be subject to the LVR restrictions. Yeah. Lastly, to following that. Uh, so, I mean, when you're buying as an investment or an occupied, usually you can get uh, loan to value ratios up to 95%, 90, 95%. If you're expecting to borrow 95 or 90% and then all of a sudden, you know, the lender say, no, you can only borrow 70% or 80%. You can imagine, you know, coming up with an additional 10%. Would, could could put you in a situation where you just can't proceed. So the other thing would be you're borrowing, uh, when you're buying an off-the-plan property that's not due to be built like a year or two years out, uh, you can't get pre-approval for that long. So what you would really want to do is not, not be pushing boundaries in terms of you know having the minimum savings or having a borrowing capacity that just scrapes by because what 
will need to happen is basically you'd need to wait until the building is constructed. And then about pre-approvals last for about three months. So, you know, within that two, three month period of when it's due to be complete and ready for, for settlement, you're going to need to get your pre-approval sorted. Um, so that means you actually won't know because one or two years is quite a long time, um, you know, in, in the finance space in terms of lending and everything like that. You can see, you know, significant changes in the supply of credit, how easy it is to get um, funds right now. Borrowing capacities are quite high because interest rates, the way they are, are being quite um, historically at a historically low level could, could mean those things change. Uh, so interest rates could increase over the next one to one to two years. Lenders might become way too risk adverse um, and, and decide to reel back uh, their risk appetite, which will start to tighten up lending, which could make it harder to get a loan. So there's these things that are moving in the background. You won't know what it could, it could, there's usually three, three outcomes. I usually say when there's uh, uncertainty like this, one would be it could go in your favor, it could go against you, or it could just stay the same. Um, in this particular case, you know, that's something to consider as well. But it also does give you a length of time to save up a deposit and you can kind of forecast those things out as well. So it does depend on what your financial position is, what your strengths and weaknesses are, um, which is basically what I would run through um, in a, in a fact find meeting just to work out what your goals are. Uh, what your strengths in their um, financial position are and then kind of proceed from there. The other thing would be if you're buying a house and land package, you're, you'll need to consider uh, your loan splits. So, you know, fixed rates are looking quite attractive because they're significantly cheaper than variable rates at the moment. Um, anywhere between, you know, almost like half a percent, um, but not exactly. But, you know, it, it can sway you to kind of want to fix your rates if you're buying a house and land package, not one, one thing you'll need to make sure is that the lender does offer a construction, a construction loan feature. Not all lenders do it. And the other thing is you may need to have set aside part of that as a variable component to facilitate the uh, construction loan. Not a lot of, I think there's only a handful and by handful, I mean like maybe one or two lenders who does do a fixed rate uh, construction loan, but you're kind of going against the grain there, um, so to speak. You'll have more lenders available at, at the variable rates. And even then, yeah, because you are doing a construction loan, not all lenders offer that. So you might find the limited number, uh, you're limited by the number of lenders that you can go to for that particular thing. And you'll also have to do that loan split with a variable rate. So, yeah. Yeah. And uh, what actually happens when people are on that, um, conveyor belt of buying the house and land packages is the floggers will say, we can get the finance for you, but it'll be at a rate that uh, is higher than what you could probably do. May not be competitive. Yeah. Uh, I think the, like from, from the way I see it, usually um, like if, if you go to one lender, you're stuck within those, the rates that they give and the credit policy. But if you have more options, usually that gives you a better chance um, of uh, securing the loan that you, you need. Um, but also as a contingent plan, you know, you've, you know, you've got other lenders. If your primary lender falls over for whatever reason, usually if you go through a broker, we should be able to identify any issues at all. Um, knock out the lenders who are you know, questioning your income because you're a contractor or you stop work for an X amount of time or there's maternity leave or you're going to be on maternity leave. Like all those things that kind of come up mm -hmm. usually, um, yeah, I'll, I'll do the preliminary research before we submit an application just to knock those lenders out. Um, and then we're just talking to the lenders who are, you know, open to the idea of approving a loan given that circumstances. So yeah, uh, th those are some of the things to consider. Um, I won't talk too much about the old property because uh, they're pretty... Um, standard, so to speak, in terms of your, your purchasing, there's still things to look at, look out for. Um, you know, like if there's carriageways or the property specifically um, itself, whether it's near power lines and things like that. But that's probably outside the scope of this particular comparison between new and old. So that's basically everything from a finance perspective. John, what's your take on uh, on on this topic from a property manager perspective? Yeah, um, that, that's interesting to hear all, all that. I, I think the, the general consensus with the tenants in, in, in the marketplace and um, especially especially so, there's been kind of a bit of a, a flip in, or, or I guess the access to uh, newer apartments for tenants 
during COVID because of the, the, the rental price drops. Uh, look, you, you know, we know there's been a lot of construction of new properties in, in the Sydney metro areas. They have become very, very popular. Uh, let's just say that um, from, from, from both investors and um, in, in particular tenants favouring the newer properties over, over the established. Let's go into... Um, Let's go into some of the reasons for that in, in the slide share here. Uh, so old apartments versus, versus the new. A, a few points I've jotted down there. Well, new apartment, number one, new apartments are uh, in fact very popular um, with, with tenants. Um, the price point, and that's become even more so prominent because the, the prices of rents have, have really dropped in that sector and there has been discounts uh, anywhere between you know 10 15 and in some cases 20 to 30 percent um, in in particular suburbs and city fringes and and the cbd itself where if you're going out to the marketplace as a tenant and you're comparing the old with, with the new if you can get a brand new apartment with all the facilities, all the mod cons, if you like, at 20 to 30% off, that basically brings down the rental price per week in comparison to the older properties. The, the choice is very clear. Those tenants living in the older apartments have upgraded and, and I've seen that happen. They've basically moved out. Thank you very much, Mr. Landlord, for uh, the last few years and we've been very, very happy in this older style place with no air conditioning, no dishwasher, um, and in some cases, no, um, no, no built-in wardrobes and, and no parking spaces. And all of a sudden, this whole new market has just opened up for them where they can grab an apartment, pretty much competition-free, because uh, we're, still, we're still in the high vacancy rate. They can go into a, a, a brand new apartment that ticks quite a lot more boxes uh, for uh, 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 not exactly the same, if not less, rent per week. That's been that's been the general trend that uh, tenants have gone out of the older ones into the newer ones at uh, the same or or lower lower rents. And and then of course uh, it opens up new facilities because large complexes. They the developers like to put the gyms in. They like to put the pools in. They like to put. Uh, other communal um, uh, areas. We've even had, you know, uh, movie movie rooms, movie theaters inside, even con um, uh, business centers where you can actually plug away on your laptop with Wi-Fi, and that's all included in in the rent. Uh, yeah, I have to I have to say that yes, there is generally a, a great appeal for new, but of course, on on the flip side. Not, not, not everybody's going to appeal to the brand new generic kind of, uh, you know, high rise apartments. They do and love and continue to love character apartments, but only, only if a lot more boxes are ticked in those older apartments. For example, they've got the built-ins, they've got the dishwasher. So here's kind of like a typical old style sort of Art Deco. I think that one's out in Rose Bay, uh, Sydney's eastern suburbs, where there's quite a lot of streets full of those. Uh, sort of Art Deco three-level walk-ups, and and if you happen to renovate them, and provide as much of the uh, newer apartment facilities, then then they will be snapped up. There's no issue, and they're not dropping. They're generally not dropping in 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 rents as well. Uh, they're maintaining. You know, you might not you may not want to live in a high-rise with hundreds of apartments, and you don't want to be a part of that community. Well, the older style. Apartments do offer that sort of boutique living, you know, where it's a, where it's a block of four, uh, a block of eight, block of ten. You don't want to go into a, you know, this high rise where there's 140, 150, 200 apartments, and everyone using those sort of communal areas, especially especially in, um, you know, that sort of. Uh, I know we're coming out a little bit out of COVID, but right at the beginning, people were very conscious of each other. Um, they didn't really want to use communal communal areas that much, you know, the gyms and pools were generally shut down anyway. So all of a sudden became a question, well, why am I, why am I paying for all this when I'm not using it? So there's budgetary, there's budgetary issues there 
uh, as well about you know paying for the facilities that you're that you're not using. So they will continue to be an appeal for the older style bro uh, blocks, providing they are up to scratch, decently renovated, and and come with what I've listed here. Quite a lot of the main attributes that tenants want, in particular, air conditioning has been an issue. We're just coming out of a really hot, steamy summer and a lot of those older style apartments don't to date have air conditioning, neither do the investors want to install them. And there's all sorts of struggles with uh, also inside of Strata with getting uh, owners corporation uh, approvals uh, for those as well, which is required. Um, dishwashers, storage and built-ins, of course, in, in, in apartment living and, and houses as well uh, that some houses to date don't have. Fly screens, so if you haven't got air conditioning and you haven't got fly screens installed where you can open up windows for fresh air, your property is going to be left out and potentially un, untenantable. You can't just assume that tenants put up with not having um, those things and certainly you ought to be sleeping uh, in the middle of summer with mosquitoes um, biting all over you because you can't open up a window. Flooring and, 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 and paint, of course, all this kind of cosmetic has to be up, up to scratch. And in particular, if you don't have NBN enabled or Wi-Fi or cabling that enable people to work from home, because of course we have the work from home phenomenon going on, your apartment also could be down the bottom of uh, the list of the many that are currently available. Uh, to sum it up, to sum it up just nicely, there's a bit of a quote yesterday in a media article from the CEO of the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales. They do collect data from their members who are um, property managers and manage large and small rent rolls. And generally the consensus, consensus is that the oldest, older style properties uh, that are uh, in need of upgrade and don't come with all the uh, the, the ticks uh, are being left out and the vacancies are prolonged. Some of these properties will be completely untenable or they will need to be discounted so much that really you got to think, well, is holding that sort of investment viable if the yield is so, so low? Yeah, so if you're, you're an investor with an older style property that you know, you, you, you've, you've, had a, you've had a good run. Potentially you've had a long tenant in there who's put up with uh, uh, not having all those things, then just be careful and be on notice that potentially your tenant is looking to move elsewhere and there are plenty available and, and then you're going to have to think of an upgrade. So you need to uh, uh, keep, a budget, uh, keep a budget in mind that uh, you need to upgrade your properties with uh, all those, um, quite a few of those uh, dot points. And I think that's a really good point and the, the point of clarification, isn't it? It's about maintaining your properties so that they are still appealing for your tenants. But on the new property side, there's some new properties that people won't move into. Like they'll choose a three-bedroom over a two-bedroom or some of those apartments the rooms are so tiny that you kind of go oh no and so they languish on the market what are your thoughts on that john yeah look uh, uh definitely deborah and um you know the two the two bedroom apartments right now are the oversupply product mm. um so that in itself can be problematic uh, you know when you have a, a whole block that's about to settle you know with 35 two bedroom two bathroom one car space and uh, the suburb next to you does the same thing and, 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 and the next suburb up, it, it's going to be problematic. And the most sought after, the most sought after uh, apartments right now are the three bedders. So the yeah. three bedders are the scarce product and the three bedroom houses are the scarce product as well. So anything three bedroom, you're fine. But anything two bedroom, especially in an apartment, uh, there's going to be challenges around that, even if it's brand new. And that's on the rental side as well? That's on the rental side, yeah. Yeah. So I wonder if we'll see that trend emerging, which they do in New York, where it will soon become viable to buy, say, a two-bedroom and a one-bedroom and knock through to, yeah, to yeah. something different. Yeah, so that kind of dual-key dual sort of property situation or two apartments next to each other. 
where yeah. you can convert because you know in apartments there's not much scope to nah. uh, to, to 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 upgrade or, or um, uh, you know knock down walls and so forth. But if you if you can pull off a deal like that or potentially a deal like that where you bought a one bedroom and a two bedroom next to each other with mm. potential to open up a wall and turn into a three, that will make a potentially a fantastic long-term investment. Yeah. And hopefully the developers are starting to get the message or well, certainly like the trend that the, the old, you know, put in three three bedroom apartments and then 25 two bedroom then 100 one bedroom to make all the money can't do that no i mean for for developers they want to squeeze out as many um as many apartments as they possibly can when they're doing high rise and yeah. too many too many three bedrooms won't won't do that for them yeah. uh, in, in in the scheme of things and and also the three bedrooms usually are snapped snapped up by uh, by own occupiers, yeah. As well, they're they're very popular for uh, for downsizers and and own, and own occupiers. But in in saying that, the developer will squeeze in more two betters into a development than than they would three, because um, they just capitalise more on on having more twos. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, but that's it. That's it for me. All right. Thanks, John. So I guess I'll wrap up this session. Uh, thanks heaps for watching. And if you do like the content, please like, share or follow. Um, and you can also join uh, the Property Mythbusters group to send us any questions or myths that you would like busted. You can also contact us directly through our websites and social media channels. Um, if you have a particular uh, scenario or query um, that you think we could possibly help you with. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.